All right, it's 6 3. Um, I think we've given three minutes to those who are late, and we've really done well on that uh, four minutes already. And thanks to every one of you for joining. Um, I don't know if I should say good evening or good afternoon, but I think um, I'll do both. Good afternoon and good evening for everyone. Um, so you're welcome to a special session that we've been looking forward to for a long time, um, Mendless Talk. And as you are aware, this is um, a series of talks that we'll be having with Dr. Tao on the topic of uh, mental well-being. And we've labeled it Let's Talk because it's really a time for us to talk. Um, it's, it's a monthly conversation that we'll be doing. And for this month particularly, we wanted to focus on our men. And we've kind of, we've been very surprised at the response that we've had from our men um, for the opportunity, looking for the opportunity for us to talk. Um, we hope that this is going to be a background, I mean, the platform where we can really talk, a platform where we can support each other and, um, and find ways to support others around us as well. So I'm going to be your host for tonight, as obviously know, and Dr. Tao is going to be our guest. Um, I, I, I'm sure we all know a bit about Dr. Tao, but for um, protocol's sake, let me just introduce him a little so we know who we are talking to. So he's, he's been in the field for a long time, and his specialty is, is into child and adolescent psychiatry and intellectual disability. And he's been practicing this for a long time, proud to um, was doing this in England. And he's currently in Qatar, based in Qatar. Um, he's married with three children, and yeah, I don't, I, I didn't get to the number of years he's married, but I guess it's quite a long time. So, Dr. Tao, thank you so much for for being our guest tonight again, and um, we hope it's going to be a very great and a very interesting discussion this evening, happening for the first time. Um, what I'll be doing is we'll be handing over to Dr. Tao um, sometime after this, but just thought I should run you through quickly what we'll be doing tonight so we'll all be on the same page. So we'll start off with Dr. Tao giving us some introduction and some presentation on some topics that are, that some areas that are of very re high relevance to us. And then we've received a number of questions from many of you already, so we'll spend time on those questions. And then after that, we open the platform up for questions, some spontaneous questions as well. Um, we want to keep it anonymous and also um, give room for people who would want to talk by themselves. If you want your message to be anonymous, please just, um, you don't want your identity tagged to it, just send me a private message with your message, I mean, with your, your question and I'll read it out to Dr. Tao at that time. Otherwise, you can just write on the chat box that you have a question and I would, I would spotlight you to ask your question. So with that out of the way, let me hand over to you, Dr. Tao. Thank you so much again, and um, please take us home. Hi, everybody. Can you all hear me clearly? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks again for the opportunity to uh, get together as men and, and to have a conversation around uh, mental health and mental well-being. Um, so today, I guess, one of the questions is why did we choose to have a, a men's session? And I think the, the idea of having a men's session is to almost underline and validate the fact that mental health is important for everybody and in particular men. And I think one way to demonstrate that is to actually give a whole time and a whole session for men to be able to come together and to be able to discuss and talk about it. Uh, and also to acknowledge that actually talking about it and having a conversation about it is the beginning of the, the whole process and what significant uh, principle or practice that actually helps our mental health is to talk. So that's the reason why we decided we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and have this main session. I'm just going to share my screen for a minute just for some introduction. Can you all see my screen? 
Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I just at uh, this section, I'm just going to briefly again. I'm just mindful. Some of us were at the last session, but some of us might be here for the first time. So I'm just going to briefly define what we mean when we're talking about mental health and, and our mind, uh, and then I'm going to just share uh, one of the um, theories around stress using the stress bucket, uh, just to give us a framework in which to discuss. Uh, and I'm going to try and do that in about 10, 15 minutes. And then we'll start to look at specific questions. Because today we want it to be more of a conversation rather than a, sort of a didactic lecture or anything like that. We, we can all take out the facts. We, we're all very schooled in doing that. But today should be really more about having that conversation. And hopefully this will be the beginning and the start of that conversation. So like I said the last time we made a healthy mind, a healthy person should have a healthy mind. And when we're talking about the mind, we're talking about our thinking process. That ability to be able to think clearly, to be able to solve various problems we're facing, to be able to enjoy good relationships with family, with friends, with colleagues, and to be able to feel spiritually at ease and be able to bring happiness to others. So this is compromising all of the various aspects. So we talk of the healthy body, we talk of the mind, and we talk how that leads into a happy life. And when we talk about the mind, I, I want us to remember we're talking about four real areas. So we're talking about our thought process. We're referring to our feelings and our emotions. We're referring to our behaviors and our relationship with others. So that when we talk about mental health, uh, it generally encompasses these four areas of our functioning as different from our physical health. And sometimes when people hear of mental health, they go straight to you know, maybe severe mental disorders. I'm talking of people who have severe enduring mental illness and disorders, which are like one extreme of the spectrum. But actually, every one of us, just as we are all engaging with physical health, we're also all engaging with our mental well-being because we all think, we all feel, we all have emotions, we all behave depending on the way we're feeling or what's going on for us. And our relationship with all those have a lot to do with the way our mind is working and, and all of those things. So, you know, if you're wondering, you know, is, does this really affect me? Does this really concern me? You know, is, is this really common to everybody? You know, when you realize that we all are engaging all of these important aspects of our lives, and that's why it's important for all of us to do that. So when we talk about mental health, we're generally talking about this aspect of our health. And, mental, and a good mental health is not simply the absence of a diagnosable mental health problem. Just as we know that you can have a good physical health, even if you have a diagnosable physical health condition. So somebody may have, for example, diabetes mellitus, but even though you are diabetic, you may still enjoy good health. Because if you look after your diabetes and you're controlling it and you're doing everything you need to do, you can still go on and live a good quality of life and still be able to enjoy good health. Uh, or somebody has high blood pressure, for instance. If you have high blood pressure, you pick that up in time. You know, you take your medication, it controls your blood pressure. You don't have any, you know, any difficulty with your heart or with your kidney. You know, you can live for a very long time and live a fairly decent life so even though you have a diagnosable physical condition, you still continue to look after that and continue with your life. So even when you have a diagnosable mental health condition, so let's say somebody has, for example, uh, 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 obsessional compulsive disorder, or somebody has had a, a, a diagnosis of depression before, that does not preclude them from having a good mental health. So the fact that an illness has occurred or that you're still managing an illness does not disqualify you. Because if you manage that illness sufficiently, you will then realize that you can actually live a relatively good life. So just as the physical body can fall ill, so also the mind. And that's what we refer to as mental illness. And, and a definition I like from the college says, and any illness experienced by a person which affects your emotions, again, we're back to the old thing again, your emotions, your thoughts, or your behavior, which is out of keeping with their cultural beliefs and personality, and is producing a negative effect on their lives or the lives of others. So that when we say, oh, is mental illness, is it limited to a particular, you know, East or West, or is it limited to a particular cultures? 
No, it, it cuts across different cultures. Okay, what about personality? Maybe I have a robust personality, maybe I'm outgoing, or maybe I, I kind of keep to myself. You know, irrespective of your personality or your beliefs or the culture where you come from, when you are experiencing, you know, uh, certain things that are out of keeping for your cultural beliefs or for your personality. So there is that test of, you know, it's, it's that change from what you used to be. Sometimes we refer to that as your pre morbid personality. You know, what did you used to be in your best of times? Now, the way you are now, are you the same compared to when you are functioning at your best of time? Are you functioning the best of way? So, for example, you know, people, somebody who doesn't believe in God or is not a Christian might say, oh, I don't believe God speaks to people or people can hear God. And if that person hears somebody says, I can hear God, they might think, oh, there's something wrong with you. But if you're a Christian and you believe that God speaks to you, but even within Christians and who believe that God can speak to them, if somebody suddenly stands up in, 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 in the congregation and say, oh, I am now Jesus Christ, all of you must come and worship me. Even within that context, people suddenly begin to say, oh, no, that's way beyond our understanding, our comfort zone. So even within that Christian understanding, you realize that something is going to miss here because what that person is expressing or the way that person is beginning to think or what that person is be able to behave, even within that cultural context, you can see that it's way, way an outlier. And that's an indication that something has begun to go amiss. So, and of course, the, the severity or the, or, or, the, or, or, or the way you measure the impact of this, you know, how do you know whether something is mild, is severe, or is profound? I guess it, it depends on how much is beginning to have an impact negatively on that person. But sometimes not just the person, but on the lives of other people around them, whether it be at work or in their homes or even in the church or anything around them. So there is not just the, the quality of what is happening. There's also the impact of how, what is happening. And sometimes when people are going through difficulties and it's just affecting them, sometimes they might just be able to manage that and you might not say anything. But of course, once it begins to go beyond themselves and begins to impact maybe their family or their work or their ability to function in different roles, then it begins to have a much more wider and significant impact. And, and when in, in, in psychiatric care, when you're kind of trying to diagnose a problem, you just don't see what's the problem. You're also trying to you know, get some idea into how was the impact of this, of this problem. So mental illness includes a broad range of health problems, and we're going to look at it, like I said. But I want us to look as, as an introduction to this. I'm just going to fast forward on this slide uh, because we've used some of the slides previously. But I just want to just bear with me for a minute. Um, yeah. So uh, I think a good way to start to have this general conversation is to go back to the subject of stress. Because oftentimes people get that question and say, oh, well, we talk about stress. How is stress related to mental health? Or how is stress related to mental health disorders? Does it mean that when I get stressed, I'm going to develop a mental health disorder or not? Or does it mean everybody, you know, so what's, what's this whole big deal about stress? I like this particular theory called the stress bucket theory by Barbara and Barbara and Tuckinstein, because it, I, I find it as a good way to try and explain. So if you look at the pictures and I'll just try and run you through. So you see this bucket and this bucket has, you know, these arrows of things flowing into it. And, and the whole idea is that, you know, this bucket is supposed to contain and keep things there. And as things are coming in, depending on the size of the bucket, it will probably be able to contain things for a while. But if there is, it continues to be a flow for a while, the bucket might get full and then you might start to have an overflow. And then once you have that overflow, that is the indication that things are beginning to go a bit wrong and things are not working. And so the whole idea is in order for this bucket to remain containable and not to overflow, then the whole concept of actually, if you cannot prevent a continuous flow into this bucket, then you have to think creatively. The only way you're probably going to make sure that this bucket is not overflowing is if you're able to find holes within this bucket so that you then create a situation where as the water is coming in, the water is flowing out. So you will then have a situation where this bucket is not overflowing. And, and stress is one of those natural things that happen in life. Life basically is a measure of stress and life happens to all of us. And if you look onto the left there, where I try to give examples, so that when we talk about this stress flowing into the bucket, 
what are some of those things that that includes? So, you know, when you talk about things like our work, our relationships, issues around money, you know, whatever we're doing, all of these things are the things that indicate that stress. Now, what does this bucket represent? This bucket represents the, the vulnerability, which is shown by the size of our bucket. And the reality in life is that we all have different sizes of bucket based on our genetics, our experiences, and our personality. So somebody else might have a huge bucket, somebody else might have a small bucket, depending on that interplay of their genetics, which has to do with their biological preposition, like somebody, do you have a family history, for example, of mental illness? If person who's come from a family where there is a significant family history of mental illness, means that they have a higher chance of probably developing mental illness than somebody else who has not come from that family. But it does not mean everybody that comes from family will necessarily have it. Now, let's talk about experiences. Some people are very fortunate in life. They've had very positive experiences. Life has been fairly good, you know, good decent childhood, good family life, well-loved, well-cared for, you know, you know, quite, you know, confident and everything has been robust. So their life experiences have been very positive, you know, developed good resilience. And life is generally good and they're happy. Somebody else might have had extremely terrible and negative life experiences, you know, which have caused a lot of trauma or they've gone through abuse or they've suffered significant loss or, or they've had all kinds of different things. So all of this are different. And then personality, you know, some people are more outgoing, some people are more quieter, some people have, have, have the ability to cope with significant challenges more than other people, other people struggle with it. Now, this, all the, the interplay of this biological uh, and experiences and our own personality can in some ways limit the size of our bucket. But the interesting thing, you will naturally expect that anybody who has a big bucket means that they might be able to tolerate stress better than somebody else. But in reality, what you find out is that you might find somebody who has a small bucket, yeah, but they are tolerating stress better than somebody who seemingly has a big bucket and yet they're struggling. And I think part of that is this key here, because no matter the size of your bucket, at some point, there will be an overflow. But depending on these holes that are in the bucket, which in this arrow on the left here, it describes as coping strategies, like these arrows there, talk about the coping strategies. What the coping strategies do is the equivalent of the holes in your bucket. And the more coping, and the coping strategies can be defined as positive or negative. Now, negative coping strategies are almost like strategies that block the holes in our bucket. So rather than actually giving you holes and increasing your capacity to contain, it reduces your capacity to contain. But if you've got very good positive coping strategies, that actually increases your capacity to be able to contain. So you might even find somebody who has a, who has a relatively smaller bucket, but who even within that bucket has developed a lot of good coping strategies. You will find out that overall, they're able to contain and maintain a good mental well-being compared to somebody else who may have a big bucket but have very little coping strategies and they're finding themselves in this overspill situation. And when you begin to have this overspill situation, that's what often results when you then begin to develop symptoms of illness or stress. And when you talk about symptoms of illness or stress, you know, it can be physical symptoms. You know, you can be talking of a, you know, a lot of issues to do with, you know, um, aches and pains, chest pain, you, you, know, you know, people can complain of headaches, they can talk about dizziness, you can talk of high blood pressure, muscle tension, jaw clenching, you know, there could be stomach and digestive problems, there could be weakened immune system. There's so many ways that stress can begin to manifest itself in both physical as well as emotional symptoms. So the most important thing really for a lot of us, irrespective of what bucket life has dealt us, what we can do in terms of where you can take control and where you can be active in kind of helping to maintain your mental well-being is to pay attention to your coping strategies. Are you developing positive coping strategies or are you habitually finding yourself within negative cycles? So, so some example of negative ones there, I give example like alcohol, drugs, not taking your medications, gambling, staying up late, smoking, not communicating, all of this can become negative things that was in our state. Or alternatively, you know, things like meditation, exercise, diet, creativity, socializing, laughter, and engaging in things that are fun and helpful. 
they then improve our coping mechanisms. So that's uh, so just to kind of round up this session, I just wanted to use this as, as a foundation because stress is common to all. And, and even for those who have had a relatively good, you know, life, whichever way you define that or not, stress is common to all. So oftentimes it is the way we interact with stress and the way we adapt and develop coping mechanisms and especially positive coping mechanisms, which will eventually determine how well we will be containing and we will not have a continual spill. And of course, as with many of these things, you can imagine maybe somebody in a relationship and suddenly is going through a huge divorce. That could be like a huge tap. And suddenly they might find out that even though they've had previous good coping mechanism before, but because this is such a significant event for them, that water may just overrun and suddenly before they were containing and being okay and suddenly now they are finding themselves in an overflow. And that can happen. And in that situation, if they recognize what the specific situation is, they can try and do something about that, reduce the flow of that difficulty there and that might help contain, or they might go back to their coping mechanism and realize, well, I need to develop a completely different new coping mechanism in order to make way for me to be able to cope with this deluge of water that is suddenly streaming into my bucket. So, you know, so I just wanted to use this as a, as a sort of background, as a general principle to help us think through when we talk about the issue of mental health and the importance of realizing that there's something we can do that is an interplay between what is happening to us and what we are doing in the way we engage with it. Uh, as we look at some of the questions, we'll be able to address some of that later. But I, I just thought that would be a good, nice introduction just to kind of set the scene before we then start to maybe talk about specific examples or specific questions that we might want to discuss about. So I'll, I'll stop here for the minute and then we'll pick up in, in some of the questions later. Thank you. Thank I'll you. Stop, I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Tao. I think that's very, very helpful. Um, what I'll do now is I'll just try and move into the kind of questions, the questions that we've received. And I think the first question really relates to, 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 to the stress bucket and all that here and what you've talked about, about the coping and then the um, coping mechanism, both positive and negative. So with all this, I mean, the first question is that, I mean, does this really affect men? I mean, do mental illnesses really affect men? Do men go through that? And if they do, then, why is it so strange that we hear so little about men talking about mental illnesses? And then the question that came also continuously, I mean, so what are some of the um, mental illnesses that men usually face? What are the most common ones? And the person also wanted to know why, I mean, does it differ in men and in women? Does it show up differently? And the person, <laughs> had put a quite a lot of questions into one. And the last part of it was that, what are the potential implications on our family if men were to take good care of their mental well-being? How would different would our families and our environments be like? I think it's a whole lot of questions combined into one, but um, I hope you'll be able to help us navigate it. Yeah, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll just kind of, I'll try and just answer that as, uh, as succinct as I can. I think the reality is that all mental health uh, in, in terms, now we're asking specifically now around mental illness. So when we're talking about mental illness, now we're talking about recognized, you know, mental syndromes. So for example, like I said, there are different kinds of mental illness, you know, either illness relating to your thought process, relating to your behaviors, relating to your emotions and feelings. So things like depression and anxiety, things like psychotic disorders, things like you know, schizophrenia, things like obsessive compulsive disorders, generalized anxiety, panic attacks, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, you have you know, different, I think the, the, the short answer is every mental illness occurs in both men and women. Now, for some mental illness, the prevalence, which is when you sample the population and at any time you try and find out how many people are suffering from this problem at a point in time. Now, there are some of them where the presentation, the people who show up that were able to see who maybe who turn up in the hospital or their GP, oftentimes many of these, you have more women in the population showing those diseases than men. So for instance, like depression, more women generally show evidence of depression than men, but it's all common. So the short answer really is 
all mental illnesses are common in uh, are the same in both sexes. But sometimes the, the rate of which is manifested or comes across to the hospitals, they're different from uh, male and female. Now, there are some specific conditions like in neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, where you're talking about things like attentional difficulties problems or where you talk about autistic problems, where actually the, the, the rate at which you see it in men is much higher than the rate you see it in women. But even in some of those conditions like depression and anxiety, the, the, the difference in the male and female is not significant. But at certain, age, certain ages, especially between 30 and going to the 50s, oftentimes, even in those mental illness where it's common in women, oftentimes you find out that the, the rate between men and women are almost at par or even slightly higher in men within that age range, which is where a lot of these things manifest. So, so, so the, 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 the straightforward answer to that is all of these are common. Now, do, do they manage, do they, the, the, the way they manifest, are they different? Yes, yeah, sometimes they might manifest differently, you know, for instance, and, and especially when you look about health seeking behaviors, men's health seeking behavior is slightly different from women. And oftentimes, I said things become really severe and really, you know, disabling. Most men might just soldier on and not really bother to do anything about it. So oftentimes in clinical practice, you might find out that sometimes for men, by the time they present, they present when the thing is at a much more severe or advanced stages. And sometimes some of these diseases, women present a bit more earlier because they have a slightly different health seeking behaviors. And it's not just in mental health. I think it's in most things. You know, for example, we talk about prostate cancer. Imagine, you know, all the, all the sort of, you know, the advert and the encouragement, you know, like in women, you know, they go for their normal mammogram maybe every five years or whatever, or do all these other screening things. And men have some of the screening tools in some of the areas related to them, but our health seeking behavior is just slightly different. So we might not go for it. Uh, but so therefore sometimes we may not see some of the milder forms of it. And uh, by the time they are presenting, especially to professionals, oftentimes it's severe. And that's why sometimes you might look and see, oh, men only get the severe form of this illness. But that's not really true. And one of the other things you have to remember that with mental illness generally, especially within the mild and moderate, even if you don't go to see a doctor or you don't do anything about it, you probably will get through it and get over to the other side and then you'll be okay. Because, you know, because we oftentimes if it's mild or moderate, you might be able to just adjust and get on with it. So it looks as if nothing has happened, but it's actually happening. It's just that you've been able to get over it. But of course, in this most severe form of it, then when you're presenting, the challenge with when you're presenting in the severe form of it is then the treatment is a bit more challenging because sometimes it's gone on for much longer or the impact of the consequences of the manifestation of that illness may have had much more severe impacts and consequences for you. So for example, somebody who has, a, let's say, a bipolar illness, which is where you have both depression and you get a period of highs, which is called manic depression. And sometimes when you're in the manic phase, you might do like terrible things. You might spend money, you might get into debt. You know, some people can even become, you know, promiscuous or, so you can imagine somebody who has a bipolar illness, who is not aware, might get into extramarital affairs, you know, might have caused severe, you know, things around the marriage. And then they discover that actually that was not just, that was related to their mental health. But the impact of that may have been severe. It may have lost that marriage by the time it comes back and recognize that, oh, this person actually has a severe enduring mental illness. You're getting treatment, even when you try to get better. But if you've lost your marriage or you've lost your business or you've lost significant things, the impact on that on your health is so significant. And therefore, it may then look as if, oh, well, maybe this thing doesn't really work, but it, it can. So it's, it's just sometimes the manifestation comes much later. And unfortunately, when it comes later, the consequences or, or, or the impact of that mental health disorder may have been a lot more, you know, uh, 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 may have had much significant impact than others. So like in anything in the physical health, the earlier you get in, the better the outcome, because you can get in, you know, support early, hopefully change the trajectory of that illness and hopefully have a better outcome. Um, I think I'm trying to think is that, uh, I think there was something, and, and I think, yeah, and, and I think when you're saying how, how will that affect us, to me, I think that's the important thing, that if, if you quickly recognize it and will deal with it, you know, if, 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 if somebody is beginning to develop, you know, uh, huge problems, you know, with, with, with their psychotic symptoms, for instance, and they get aggressive, you know, we've seen people who have either, you know, either physically hurt somebody or done something to other people. 
if, if that happens, then it can have a significant impact. If you pick up it early, then you try and prevent some of the very negative fallout from managing your mental health. So I think that's an important aspect of it, yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks Dr. Tawo. I mean, that's very insightful. I mean, we'll take another question from um, Vinod. Um, Vinod, you can go ahead with your question now, please. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Tango, good evening. It's a pleasure. Very good. It's a privilege for us to get ourselves clarified. Now, my question to you is, uh, Dubai, you know, the profile of the population here, you know, the majority of them are expats and we are all working here. And our life is so knitted with our jobs and sudden losing of a job leaves us on the edge and uh, which will also destabilize our staying in this country you know we'll lose our residency and with no plan and as it happens suddenly the redundancy is loss of job we do not have any plan b back home you know uh, will this lead to any mental illness and if it leads what type of illness it is and how to cope with this this is my question. I just realized I muted myself. Thanks, thanks for that question. Um, that, that's an important question and we have to look at it, I think, um, slightly in multiple dimensions. Yeah, I think in reality of somewhere like, you know, Dubai and which is sort of similar to other Gulf states, which, which is about the, uh, the, the way jobs and life and everything is so i think one of for me one of the main things there is if, if i if i kind of want to summarize is that how do you cope with uncertainties because that's really the sort of the, the bottom line of that is, is the uncertainty in what you're grappling with and what you're dealing with and can that have an impact on your mental health or not and, and for specifically in this case it's, it's talking about the jobs and i think yes in in, in a way it is true that when you're dealing with uncertainties, it can have an impact on, on your mental health. But I think for me, the important thing we have to look at here is that different people are, everybody is not entirely the same in this situation. Let's say, for example, you find some people who are here who are choosing to be in that situation. They had a choice. They could have been in a different situation. They know that this is risky, things can change, but they, they, they love that sense of adventure. They love what that offers. They're willing to put themselves into it. So they chose to put themselves in it. Some of the people are there because, you know, it was more like that was a way out for them. That was an opportunity that came. If, if they had a choice, they might not necessarily have chosen, this is what I want, but that's the best they have in that situation. So for that person, the way they appraise that situation is slightly different from the person who made that choice. Uh, and then for somebody else, this is just this is just life. That's just what it is, and you just get on with it. And why I said why I said let's go back to that beginning. Why is that's important? Because the amount of stress or the impact of the stress that that might mean might represent something different for different people. And that's why you might see two people exactly in the same situation: one lose their job, and the other one just able to take it on the chin and move on, and the other person. It's just a complete devastation. So sometimes it also depends on what was their primary state before they came into the situation, what brought them into the situation. And so, so it's important to be mindful that, you know, the foundation of where you're starting from can have an impact on the trajectory that this uncertainty will have on you. Also, depending on at what stage in your maybe if career you're doing this, you know, for somebody who is starting their working life, who is coming to this situation, it's very different from somebody who is maybe retired and decided, I want another challenge, I'll come into this situation and then do it. Because the, the loss of that job will represent something slightly different from them. But, you know, just telling it now though, I'm coming to the point, if, if we're talking about uncertainties, the one, one common helpful principle is we have to appraise our situation and realize there are some things I can do nothing about, and there are things I can do something about. Now, we cannot spend all our time and energy focused on what you can't really do anything about. 
you know, whether that job is going to cease or whether the economy will change suddenly or, or whether there'll be a global pandemic like we all saw last year. None of us have any control over that. So we cannot afford to focus and spend too much of our energy on that. But what are the things within your control? For example, if I'm in a job, if there, if there are two of us in the job and they're going to sack one person, and if they're going to look at the performance on the job as a criteria to keep one person, am I performing at my utmost best on this job? So if you're on a job and you're doing your utmost best from your performance point of view, optimally, then you know at least you have done your best in that situation to be able to do it. So I think you know one helpful thing here is to focus on what are the things that have within my control. How can I make sure that this uncertainty does not become a paralyzing effect? Because you can imagine if you're working in this environment and if it becomes so stressful that you cannot perform optimally, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because even the job you're doing, you will not be able to perform that job to the best of your ability. And the chances is you'll probably lose that job anyway because you're not performing as best as you could. Therefore, anything you can do to put yourself in an optimal functioning will only help at least within all that is possible for you to be able to do that and do it in a way that is helpful and meaningful. So, you know, so looking at what are the things within your control, what are the things within your own person that you can help to keep yourself as well as you can and maintain, you know, that good mental state, I think is a really important aspect we have to do here. Of course, linking in with people, even when we're here, you know, wisdom is profitable to direct. Part of living in a setting like this and linking in with people and getting some understanding in terms of what works, what is helpful, and connecting with people who have been enough in the system to either try and guide you and direct you, it's also important. And that's where, you know, having like-minded people within the same areas and all of that, it's a really important thing to do that. Yes, like in any sphere of life, like you said, as I said to you, as you look at that bucket analogy, that is a streaming thing, you know. For some people, they will be able to cope with that. If you discover, in fact, in fact it's interesting, I just remember that. I was reading something just within a few weeks ago, actually, about a young guy who came from India. Family sold all of their land and possession to be able to get this guy to pay for an agent to bring him in, and he was doing laboring job in, in Qatar. Uh, and unfortunately, within three or four weeks when he arrived in Qatar, he just found the living condition extremely impossible. And he started getting back to the family and he was already saying, look, I don't think I can cope with this. Unfortunately, I think less than two months, this guy committed suicide and killed himself. Now that's such a, uh, that's such a sad situation because even immediately he got into that situation, for that one, he realized there was just no way he could cope with the uncertainty in that system. Uh, and unfortunately, I, you know, I don't know the details of that story, but it just meant for him, he just couldn't see any way out. That the only thing out was to do something to himself. So I guess that's the other extreme of it. If you're in that situation and you find that the volatility and, and the stress of the situation is just overwhelming and it's almost coming to a point of where are you losing your life or not, that you may have to seriously consider whether actually are you cut out for this bit? Should you be looking for a different option or finding a way out or actually giving yourself a limited time in this setting and already begin your plan to be able to have an exit strategy in order to keep your sanity. So those are the two other extremes. But in the middle, I think for me, it's about how you live in the system. What are the things you can take in the situation? So is that situation about when life gives you, you know, when life gives you life, you can try and make a lemonade out of it. In the context of your day to day, and another important thing also is that because of the fear of what might be coming, you have to be also mindful that you have to live in the moment because you cannot continue to live in the dread of what might happen and then you lose sense of the moment. And that's oftentimes where the whole, especially the area around our mental health can be affected. So we have to be mindful that if we're worrying and we're so worried about what's going to happen, what's going to happen, we may not even be able to enjoy the moment of what you're trying to live in. So pay attention to and be mindful of how you are living in the moment and making the best of that situation to the best of your ability. Some of those things you're worried about may not happen. There are people who thought, oh, I'm going to be only for one year and 10 years later, they're still there. So imagine if the last 10 years, all they've been doing is just worrying about the day they're going to get their sack letter. That's 10 years of their life gone and they've done really nothing about it. So we have to really try and, you know, 
appraise and have a sort of, you know, that whole prepare for the, you know, um, prepare for the, offer the best and prepare for the worst kind of mindset. But, you know, the, the whole process of mindfulness and living in the moment and kind of trying to enjoy the moment as best as you can and live in that moment and enjoy all the things that you can do in the moment while at the same time, you know, still being mindful of what it is to come. It's, it's a really important uh, component to think there. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think I'll, I'll take this to, and I might, I might come back again to it if we have a bit more time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's already very well said. Thanks, Dr. Tao. And we'll move on to the next question from Mark. Um, Mark, you can go ahead with your question, please. Um, oh, um, hi, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Taiwo, for your time and good to see everyone. Um, my question kind of follows on a little bit from uh, that question we just had. Uh, a bit about life in Dubai is that people come and then often leave unexpectedly. And as a result, that can kind of make it hard to develop deeper friendships um, with people around us because they might be leaving um, anytime. Where it's a bit un uncertain. Um, and I guess that's even escalated a bit more with men where we often don't like to talk so much about what's going on in our lives. We tend to talk more about what's going on around with the cricket, the football, the COVID, um, whatever's happening. Um, and so I guess the question around that is how can we care for each other as men when we're not so good at uh, talking about these things? And then if someone does talk about these things to us um, and shares his problems, how can, we, uh, how can we really listen and support our, our friends or our colleagues in that situation? Thank you for that. Um, I think there, there are two aspects to that and, and it's about thinking about, so I think one of the aspects is saying, how can we listen well? How can we be more supportive and pay attention when we when we're interacting with with, with one another um, um i'm just gonna sorry i'm just gonna quickly share my screen i think it might just be uh, helpful to sorry my computer is not Yeah, okay. So I think I'll, I'll just share this slide just so that at least we, we, we can sort of read alongside as I'm talking. Uh, it's, 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 it's one of those helpful advice adopted by Goodall in 1994. And I think like Riley said, I think one of the important things for men is sometimes, yeah, we, we relate and we interact, but it's kind of superficial and we don't get into the depth of things. And, and therefore that can increase that sense of isolation or loneliness or not being able to put roots down. Uh, and I think if there's anything COVID has probably thought us is to highlight just the importance of that social connectedness. And again, going back again to, you know, the point I was making in that earlier slide that we can get into the situation where we can become so focused on the fact that this is temporary and it might not last and you get onto that belt and you lose the, the perspective of, okay, I need to live in the moment and I need to make the best of every day. So like whatever may I get here, I want to make the best of it. And I think for men, realizing that one of the things we need to start thinking about is talking about our feelings, talking about what we're actually going through, talking about what we're feeling. And I, and I say, for instance, when COVID came in, I remember that one of the first things I said to people is, you know, you need to give yourself permission to begin to talk to people and to feel free that you can share your feelings. But specifically around the ability to be able to listen and work with people, uh, I think it's important that when we're interacting with one another to recognize that we need to be alongside each other and we need to listen to people in an accepting and non-judgmental way. Sometimes people are a bit hesitant to talk because 
they might feel that maybe other people might judge them. And especially men, you know, we think, you know, you have to be strong. You don't have to show any weakness or vulnerability. You know, you need to be carrying everybody along. And, and if you feel that, if you say something, people might, you know, be condescending or might take it the wrong way. That might prevent you from actually talking and opening up. And, and if we show and understand that we, we understand something of what people are going through, that's always a way to help them. I know you might say, well, maybe I, I'm not exactly in that situation. But if somebody is going through something that is, let's say, depressing or something that is really quite bad, yeah, you may not have a depressive disorder, but I'm sure you have been sad before. You've lost either lost a loved one or something has happened to you that has brought sadness. So you know something of what that feeling is like. You might not know it to the depth of, you know, being in a significant depressive illness, but you know something of what it means to maybe be down or to be unhappy or to have been upset about something. So we, we can relate to them. And encouraging people to talk is always the first and most important thing. Because, you know, like that's popular saying, the problem shared is a problem halved. Once you can take something out of your mind, just processing it and you, and you externalize it and you say it, sometimes you don't even need other people to give you the solution. It's just saying it out, hearing it yourself and then processing externally will help you to begin to look at that. So one of the other ways that also can be helpful is, you know, when we're talking to people, can we tolerate silence? Somebody might be trying to say something and they're struggling. Sometimes as men, we, we struggle to be able to describe our emotions or what we're actually feeling or what we're going through. You know, if you are the one who is able to gently listen, encourage them on, if you see that they're struggling with it, you just give them time. You don't kind of rush them and say, oh, what are you trying to say? Or oh, let's move on to something else. You can tolerate those silences. You can give them the, 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 the perspective that you are actually actively listening and, and you can recognize that they're struggling with it, but you're willing to give them time, allow them to be able to talk. And, and if people become emotional in that process, you know, learning to be comfortable with that, don't kind of go, oh, you know, even if, even if you're a bit surprised, try and keep it to yourself, but not suddenly say, oh, you know, why are you breaking down? Or why is this happening? Or, you know, recognize that this is part of that whole process. And as part of that, once you are able to hear or get what people are talking to, then you can offer appropriate reassurance. And the emphasis there is on the appropriateness of the reassurance. You know, we're not saying promise heaven and earth. I mean, I mean, promise things you can know, but you can offer assurance that is appropriate, that is commensurate to what they're kind of trying to deal with you. And the other thing we have to accept that we cannot always fix situations. And oftentimes when people come to us, they're not necessarily looking to us to fix their situations. It's just having somebody else to share and to walk alongside you and to be able to encourage you in what you're going through. So don't, sometimes people don't really want to get deep with people or connect with people because they think, oh, are they going to expect me to fix this issue? I, you know, I can't even fix my own problem. I, I'm not ready to start solving other people's problem. Actually, it's not about solving other people's problems. Sometimes it's just about sharing the problem. Sometimes it's just about helping one another along the way. So don't, you know, because as men, sometimes we think, oh, if we get into a situation, we have to get into it to sort it out. Uh, and sometimes it's not about sorting out. It's just walking alongside and being alongside people. And then it's also important for you to be aware of your own issues and your limitations. So that in the bid to support people or to look after people, you don't put yourself in a vulnerable situation or you don't damage yourself in the process. So if you find out that somebody is trying to bring something to you that you think, oh, I can't really deal with this, or you, know, you can imagine maybe you've gone through some traumatic issues, uh, let's say with abuse before, and then somebody comes to you and wants to talk about abuse, which is going to trigger some things and you don't want to go there. You need to be mindful of that. And you can gently say, I hear, I can see that something is going on here and you need to sort this out. But I'm sorry, I'm not the right person to really deal with this. Can I, you know, encourage you to either speak to this person or, or I know somebody actually will really be able to help you. So it doesn't mean you just shut down and dismiss them. But it doesn't also mean that you have to be, you know, you don't, you, you don't have to pretend and put yourself in a situation where you're going to make your own mental state worse just because you want to try and support them. You can be honest, but the way you do that is to say, I'm, I'm, I recognize there's something here and you need somebody to do that, but I'm not the best person to do that. So I'll either link you up with somebody else or encourage you to seek help in an appropriate way to be able to help you that. And then you can go back and check up with them and say, did you actually go and do that? Did you do that? So that that way they still realize that you care for them, you're concerned about them. And these are little, little ways, because sometimes you might be able to pick among some of your friends. You know, this guy used to be really bubbly and lively and everything. And then suddenly he's gone withdrawn, he's gone sullen, 
and, and work is getting stressful and every day, and you can see it. Just, you know, start that conversation. You know, what's going on there? Don't be worried that, well, I don't know, I might not be able to solve it. No, just giving them an opportunity to talk, highlight it. You might then be able to encourage them to seek the appropriate help and to be able to get into it. And like I said, the last thing there is know when you should refer on. And that's really important. So, so I think, again, following on from that, it's important that as men, even in the process of what we're doing together, let's be sensitive to each other. Let's begin to try and create an opportunity for conversations. And let's not be afraid to begin to actually ask people questions. Mm -hmm. Especially if you've noticed something is going on there, ask the questions. Don't be afraid oh, if I ask the questions, but I won't be able to solve it. No, it's not about you solving that problem. It's about helping to bring that situation to the surface. And sometimes all you might need to do is look, oh, I can see there's a problem here. I think you need to go and get help. Why don't you speak to, you know, if it's a spiritual situation, why don't you speak to one of the elders? If it's a physical health thing, why don't you go and see your GP? Or why don't you go into the hospital? Or if you don't really want to go, do you want me to come along with you? Okay, I'll give you a lifting. Tell me the day you want to go. So there are practical ways that you can just gently and supportively move people along the right way without taking responsibility for them or feeling, no, oh, I've got to go there and solve it, or I've got to get myself damaged in the process. We can do it safely and wisely, but the important thing is about making sure that we're beginning to engage one another and create an opportunity to have those conversations. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Tao. I think there are a couple of people that I need to give a call right after this to connect with them seen considerable change. Thanks so much. Um, we'll move on to the next question from Vili. Um, Vili, um, you may go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Thank you, Dr. Taiwo, for your time. Um, a huge, um, a huge uh, significant pop population in Dubai are all expats. So I think roughly 80 to 85% are all expats. So that means be, uh, a lot of people living here are away from homes and away from families, and and in this in that situation, a lot of people are also living alone, you know, away from families. And speaking for myself, I'm single as well. So so there's a lot of um, people that are expats that are singles, and a lot a lot of expats that are also unmarried, and so I mean have are married and have families at home, so they could you know be working here alone, and the families are. You know, this, this, the wives at home and back at home and the children are back home. So my question is, um, what are the potential mental health issues uh, we men face in these kinds of situations? And how can we protect our mental well-being when we live alone? Um, I think that's, uh, that's, an, that's an important uh, point in terms of uh, living alone and, and, I, and again going back again to that point I raised in, in terms of like you said you know for, for some people that is a lot easier than other people you know depending on your temperament depending on what sort of relationship you have depending on whether you know you've been away for a while and been reconnected back suits you or or whether you know you really want to be together all of the time, and, and I think that the reality is that there is a huge potential there, and it's really about isolation. That's that's really the thing, and and I oftentimes I say to people and even to 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 some of my patients, isolation is a killer, uh, because when we become isolated, things become amplified in in our mind. Things become amplified in our understanding and in our orientation and they can become paralyzed uh, and that can happen to anybody and isolation and loneliness can even happen even when you're with people because the sense of isolation is when you feel that what you need from other people around you that need cannot be met and you are in a situation where you feel i cannot meet that need myself that's what creates that sense of isolation and that sense of loneliness so you can see that there's a possibility that you can see a single person who thinks what I need, I can give myself and I can create my own world and, you know, make myself happy and I'm content in that and they won't be lonely. And yet another single person who thinks this is what I need, but I'm not able to provide that thing I need. I would like somebody else to provide it, but there's nobody else to do it. 
Therefore, it creates that sense of loneliness and all of that. So in some ways, you know, that loneliness is, 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 is kind of conceptualized in your narrative and, and your own internal dialogue and may not necessarily be true for the physical environment. And why I'm saying that is it's possible that you might even see people who are in families or they have other people around them and yet they might still be lonely. Because it's if that, you know, that, that feeling that I am not connecting with somebody or I am not connecting sufficiently enough to be able to get what I need in that connection. And so if we flip that on the head, then it's about, you know, if we're on our own or we're lonely, again, it goes almost back again to that mind, almost bucket analogy. What are the positive habits that we can develop to begin to help us? So I give an example. If, if I know that I'm an outgoing person and my energy is being with people, you know, if I'm staying at home and I'm by myself, it just depresses me and makes me feel lonely. Then, you know, creating a situation where you're linking with people, you're have, developing friendships, you're having people that you can do things with together or you can go and do things. For you, that's a really important thing. So you have to invest a bit of your time and your energy to make sure that you're connecting with people, people of like-mindedness and all of that, in order to make sure that that aspect of your person is being met. So having some awareness of what works for you and what feels, you know, that's your emotional tank, it's really important because then that then kind of gives you an idea of what you need to invest in from a psychological or emotional aspect to make sure that you do not find yourself in that lonely, isolated spot. For some other people, you know, they, they have very busy jobs and they just like to get away from it all and recharge themselves before they come back. For that person, if they're hanging out with people all of the time, it will actually exhaust them and almost send them, have a negative impact on their mental health. So such a person has to give themselves permission to say, look, I actually like to be on my own. I need that time to refresh. I need that time to regain myself. So I'm going to take myself out of this situation. And sometimes I'm just going to have that me time. And you give yourself permission to just be on your own. You want to watch a movie or do whatever you need to do. So it's important to kind of try and find out what suits your personality and what enables you to be able to feel connected and content in yourself. So that's really important thing. And oftentimes, I think it's sometimes as men, we don't pay attention to kind of trying to understand some of these dynamics. We just feel I'm a man, I just have to, I just have to be strong and do it. But you're not actually taking time to try and understand yourself, try and understand your strengths. And, and everybody does this, so I'm just going to do the same. Everybody goes and play football, so I'm just going to play football, or I'm going to do this. There are so many ways you can meet your needs, but the first and most important thing is try to get a measure of self-awareness and be honest with yourself. What is it that I really feel I need to make me feel connected and makes me feel contained in myself. And then once you can identify that, then invest a lot of time and energy. Look for relationships that will be able to feed that. Look for activities or hobbies that will be able to feed that. And I think one of the things COVID has taught us, even with all this COVID, when we're not even physically able to meet with ourselves, you just suddenly realize that actually you can pick up the phone, you can still connect with people even when you're not in the same physical space with them. So, and I think thankfully for technology, so some of us who are away without a family, you know, do we need to be prioritizing our communications either with our spouse or with our family? And you don't need to apologize for that. You know, if you want to spend two, three hours after work each day and talk to your wife or talk to your children, and that's what works for you, then you don't need to apologize for that. You spend whatever time you need in order to be able to do that. If for somebody else, no, going back to their flat is not going to help. I remember like when I was, uh, doing a locum in, in Durham and I was away from my family. My family were in, uh, in Scotland and I'm one of the way I don't like to go home. I don't like to be by myself. So every day when I leave work, I used to go for walks around Durham city, which is a really beautiful city. And you've got lovely walks. And sometimes I'll be like two, three hours. And during my work, I ring my wife, I do everything. So basically all I go back to do home is just sleep because every time I'm in that room, I just find it depressing. That's just me. So I spent as little time in, in the place where I was living every time I was outdoors. But at the same time, I didn't really particularly want to be with people because that will exhaust me. So I just, I, I never liked nature or walking before. It was when I got to Durham, I had to develop that. 
because that was the way I had to adapt to find a way to make, to get what was right for me. You know, I didn't want to be in the house. I didn't necessarily want to spend all my time with people. So I began to discover, oh, actually I can enjoy going for walks. Oh, so going for walks along the river, just, you know, going to the promenades, doing all of these things that I thought I hated and I would never love. I suddenly found actually, for me, it was a healthy way of keeping me positive and keeping my mental state. So I think it's important to understand yourself and try and understand what will work for you. And it might be different. So don't be, don't be afraid to play with it. And if you try one, it doesn't work, then do something else. You know, some people will find sports. Some people will find, you know, I, I remember one of my favorite pastimes is just go to the cinema with my popcorn and my, and my drink and, and maybe watch a film. And sometimes I will do that maybe once a week. So I just look for different things. But again, it goes back again to that point about saying you've got to live in the moment. You cannot spend all your time worrying and feeling sorry about what you don't have or what is wrong because that will not really help the situation. So what can I control? What can I do? How can I do something that enables me to be able to live in the moment and make the best of that opportunity to the best of my ability? And I think if we have that sort of mindset, then we can begin to really look at it and pursue it in a way that is healthy and safe and wholesome for us. And we'll not find ourselves in a place where we will think, oh, I don't want something that will become negative and become a liability to either you or your family or your loved one. I don't know if that makes sense here. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Dr. Tawo. Um, we'll take um, the last of the questions that we got coming in, and that's going to be from Rena. Um, Rena, you, you can go ahead with your question, please. Thank you, Abed, and um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Taiwo, um, thank you so much for having this session tonight with us. <clears throat> this is very helpful and very encouraging. So if you don't mind, I have two questions uh, to ask tonight. Um, <clears throat> you discussed earlier about um, cultural um, belief and personal behavior. And here in Dubai, <clears throat> we are a very diverse culture and it plays a lot of our, um, <clears throat> that diversity plays a lot um, of a very significant role of our lives and kind of defines our, um, who we are as a man. Okay, now my question is, in what ways can this affect our mental well-being and how can we deal uh, with it? That's my first question. And my second question will be, as a Christian man, if you, you see around, <clears throat> most of these men are serving a church. Does our mental health affect our spiritual lives? That's my second question, Dr. Taiwo. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think culture is powerful in, in the fact that culture sort of defines how we make sense of the world around us. Um, and, and therefore we need to be mindful of that and pay attention to that and, and recognize how our cultures may play a role. And then our culture also affects how we engage. You know, so for instance, how do you meet up with, I, I'll give you a practical example. When I first moved from Nigeria to Ireland and I was working in, in a hospital in a village on the west of Ireland called Kasuba. And I was with colleagues there. And, and on most Fridays, my colleagues at work will invite me to the pub and say, oh, we're going to the pub, do you want to come? And I've, I've, I just came out from Nigeria. Uh, in Nigeria, only sinners <laughs> go to pub. You know, most Christians will know, we don't have a pub culture. So Christians are not supposed to be seen in pub. I've never been in a pub my entire life. So when I got to Ireland and this guy says, do you want to come to the pub? I was like, so like, no, I, I'm sure, you know, in my mindset, it's like, no, no, it's like, no, there's no way I can go to the pub. So every time they ask me, I just say no. And then I then realized that actually, and then I felt my colleagues were not friendly. They were not, you know, because what I was expecting was somebody will say, oh, do you want to come to my house for a meal? And we can sit down and we can talk and all of that. And nobody ever invited me to their homes. But well, every Friday, I got this invitation to the uh, pub, which I turned down. And then after a couple of weeks, they stopped asking me. 
And then it was only months later, I suddenly realized that in Ireland, most people don't actually socialize in their houses. They socialize in the pub. So basically, when these guys were saying to me, let's go to the pub, it was an invitation to say, we want to know you a bit better, not just as work colleagues. Let's hang out together so we can have time to interact. So I missed it completely because I didn't understand the culture of it. Thankfully, you know, uh, and, and then thankfully we, we used to have some evening educational programs, which goes with a meal. And then I began to hang out at the meal and it was only as I met them in the meal, I then suddenly realized that none of them actually go to each other's house. They all meet in the pub and then the penny dropped for me that all that invitation to come for a coffee or to come for pub was basically the way the guy saying to me, let's hang out together less from relationship. And that's why sometimes where there can be clash of cultures. So sometimes you might feel maybe people are not helpful or they are not nice or they are not those because you're expecting them to do it in a particular way because that's the way you always do it. But other people might do it slightly differently. So I think part of the challenge when we're in a mixed culture is not just to do things your own way, but also to understand that certain people might do certain things differently. And, and especially if you want to integrate and interact, you sometimes have to be willing to step out of either your comfort zone and, and, and find out what exactly they are trying to do. So, so that's how, you know, culture, because there, you know, thankfully, I, you know, I was with my family and I was quite content and I had a good church family as well. And it was even later, even when I went to the church and then suddenly I realized because I could remember the first time when I was in church and was with my pastor and the guy asked for a pint of Guinness and I almost fell out of the chair. It's like, my pastor is drinking Guinness. But of course, my Nigerian mentality where it's a, it's a complete, uh, you know, no alcohol kind of concept. And, you know, so to so imagine your pastor drinking alcohol, it's like, wow, what's going on here? So, so that was even, and then I said, but of course with time I began to, yeah, I can say, Andrew say Guinness is a dark Irish bear. Yeah, it's very popular in Ireland, <laughs> you know, and, you know, so, that is how cultures can play and how we can affect it. So, so especially when we come to somewhere like Dubai, we need to be mindful that different cultures and there are some nuances and, and certain things. But let's be open and be willing to learn, be willing to embrace and, and, and see different people for what they have and not be quick, completely closed. Now, I think the second question was around spirituality. Yes, I think unfortunately within, I think for me, one of my, one of my greatest sadness is that within the church, there is a huge stigma and a huge negativity around mental health. And oftentimes people who have mental illness are seen to be either less spiritual or people who are not strong Christians. In fact, some people will even say, oh, mental illness is all spiritual and is due to demon possession and, and, and something has happened to you. So it's all spiritual and all of that. And, and because of that, then that can have a negative effect on you seeking help or talking about it. So if you look at the prevalence of mental illness, one out of every four people over the course of their lifetime will have some measure of difficulties with their mental illness. And at any point in time, one out of six people in every particular week is impacted by mental health. So there are significant people within the church who are having to struggle with one thing or the other. Yes, yeah, so, and if you remember my definition of mental illness, one of the things I, when I was talking about a healthy mind is that a healthy mind puts you at spiritual ease. You can actually not connect with your brethren and enjoy deep spiritual nourishment if you are struggling with your mental health. Imagine somebody who is going through a depressive episode. One of the things depression sometimes when you're going through depressive episodes, you develop very negative affect. You develop a very negative thought about yourself, your self-worth, your confidence in yourself. Sometimes you feel people don't like you. People don't want to be around you. And sometimes you might find yourself not wanting to go to church, not wanting to be around people, not wanting to connect with people. Sometimes if you find somebody who has a paranoid psychotic illness, they might start to suspect people or think people are saying things about them or saying things behind them. You know, if you can imagine if you are very paranoid and you are in a church and things are going on, you'd be thinking, you know, is somebody saying something about it? Did they look at the, Even the pastor might be preaching and you say, oh, maybe the pastor is preaching about me. That thing he said was supposed to be me or maybe because I told him something yesterday. That's why I say it tomorrow. So you can see how even your mental state can start to interact and play with your spirituality. 
Uh, and so, so it's important that even we, we need to recognize that, that our mental state can affect how well we, we, we live and how well we interact. If you go to a group and you feel that maybe people don't love you or you don't understand the way they are reaching out to you, you can become isolated. You know, I remember saying to people, you know, if I ask you, how, why do, how do you think your church is your church a loving church? Most of us would think about it by thinking, do I feel I'm receiving love? And if the way people show love to you is slightly different from the way you expect them to show it to you, which might have sometimes cultural differentiations. So you might even be there and feel that like these guys are not loving or they're not caring enough because you don't get it the way they do it. So, so it can have a, an insidious impact on the way we think and the way we interact and we relate. And that's where some of the openness and the opportunity to learn from each other's culture, the opportunity to get to know each other, and, and that willingness to be vulnerable and to be open. And that's where it's really important and, and informing deeply, and especially as men, because, you know, uh, so any opportunity to get together as men or to get in small groups or to hang around around certain activities that break some of those boundaries that then help us to begin to connect, it's really important to be able to move us along that direction. Awesome, awesome, thank Did you. I did I answer the last part of it? I'm sorry, I think I've lost my. What, what, was that the second bit of the question? Yes, I think you, yeah. I think you okay. did. How, how does uh, mental um, mental health, how does this affect our spirituality? So, actually, it does. Yeah, I mean, you, you did answer it. And I think talk about Guinness and the pub really got a lot of comments coming in. And thanks to <laughs> Andrew for providing some cultural context to it. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's the end of uh, um, of the questions that we received. Um, however, we are still getting some more questions. Um, some are coming to me privately, and some okay. to the chat. Um, let me take a few. Um, some people would want to be anonymous, so they've asked me to do this on their behalf. So let okay. me go ahead. And, do that. and the question relates to stress. Okay. Yeah, the first one is that can anyone get used to stress? That I mean. Um, is, is, there, is there a problem if someone has gone through a state of stress for a long time that the person is now used to it? Is, is, that, is that considered a mental illness as well? Um, well I, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by getting used to it. Yeah. If getting used to stress is like in that bucket analogy, for example, you find yourself, let's say for, you, for instance, if I find being alone without my family stressful, but, you know, due to, you know, different situation, I need to be in Dubai. And at the moment, I can't bring my family. And that's a decision that me and my family would come to accept and to say, we need to do this for the season. Mm -hmm. And then in that, I have found ways to help me cope with that in a way that is not having in, let's go back again to the definition of mental health, in a way that is not having a mental impact, a negative impact on my functioning, on my thinking or emotional ability to function and no negative impact on my performance in my job or in anything else. If, if I'm in that kind of state, then in that way you can say, yes, this is stressful, this might not be my option, but I have found a way around it, so I'm coping with it. But actually, if it's a situation where I'm in this job and I'm beginning to have palpitations, uh, I'm beginning to develop high blood pressure, you know, I'm having different days where I'm having a headache, you know, or you've been investigated, you're a woman, you know, you're beginning to have even problem with infertility to conceive. You know, these are all the manifestations of stress. If the stress is ongoing and we don't deal with it, it can result in significant physical health difficulties. And sometimes the reason why some of us don't recognize their stress is because we see the we see the physical health consequence, and in our mind we just see that our problem is physical health, but we don't appreciate that the trigger for that physical health problem is a mental health situation. So in that way, you know, because if you look at what stress does, when you're stressed, you know, the, the, the stress is normal to a certain level, but when you become stressed all of the time. It wears out your system. Stress is a risk for vascular diseases. Stress can be a risk for stroke, for high blood pressure. Stress can be a risk for significant physical health difficulties. You know, headache, dizziness, exhaustion, feeling tired all of the time. So no, so stress, to, to remain in a 
heightened state of stress, it's not healthy. And one way or the other, we give up. Either we end up developing you know, significant mental health problems or significant physical health problems. But the important thing is how do we manage stress, you know, and how do we do that in a way that is helpful, you know. Uh, so, so for me, you know, it's, it's about that whole point about, you know, how do we manage stress, develop a good sleep routine, you know, develop a good nutrition and healthy lifestyle. We need to sleep well, make sure we're sleeping well. We need to make sure that we, we can try and structure our day and make sure everything is going well. You know, are we engaging in enough exercise? Because when we're exercising, as we need to, you know, all the nice positive hormones that exercise generates counteract the hormones that stress are generating. So for me, stress is never something that should be continuous on you. You need to manage stress. So the way I like to do it is just as we have good physical health um, habits, we need to develop good mental health habits. So having a good, you know, uh, positive outlook to life. You know, sometimes I say to people, you know, make sure you're getting good sleep, good rest. Make sure your nutrition is good. You're not abusing substances, whether it be alcohol or drugs or anything, or trying to numb yourself. You are engaging in good physical exercise to actually make you feel better. You're connecting with people. You're not isolating yourself. You are actively seeking to create an atmosphere of fun and positivity around you you are reaching out to help others because sometimes by reaching out to help others help you to lift you out of your own situation. So you have to manage stress. Just don't leave stress and let it continue because ultimately it will cause significant damage if you don't deal with it. So now I'll let you yeah. go. Yeah, okay. All right. Thanks, thanks. I mean, there's so many, so much comments happening here. It sounds so very funny on this topic of getting it, but let's not talk about stress. <laughs> Uh, so the second question, which um, um, yeah I got here, is that, and the person is talking about coping mechanism. It says, yeah. can it be used? Is there a risk that someone can use a good coping mechanism as an escape? And yeah, and how do we balance that? So that's the question. Mm. Can you use a good coping mechanism as an escape? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It can be because I think I think there's that I'm, I'm kind of trying to I'm trying to imagine where that question is or where that is coming from. Um, one of the first things that come to my mind is let's say for example you have an eating disorder. An eating disorder is when you are fearful about your body uh, and whether you're worried about being fat or being too thin and things like that, and therefore you start to restrict your diet. And sometimes what you might find is some people might start to exercise excessively. As I said, exercise is good, but if you do it in excess, then it can become a problem. Then it becomes almost like an escape from actually dealing with the situations that you are actually facing. Yes, yeah, so good coping mechanisms, like everything else, everything with moderacy and good. So, I, so I, except maybe if, if the person are giving maybe specific questions that I might have been able to, but yeah, but I think... Theoretically, it's possible because, you know, like everything else in life is, is about balance. If we keep it in balance, then that's fine. So, you know, we talk about eating well. Some people can overeat and that causes a problem. Some people can undereat and then it causes a problem. So exercise is good. Some people can overexercise and that causes a problem. Some people can underexercise and it causes a problem. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, yeah, that, that's a possibility. The, but I think it's about paying attention to what is motivating you and that you're doing it with the right motive and you're doing it in the right thing. Yeah. So it's kind of, yes, it's yes. possible. Yeah. Yes. Got it. So, I mean, I have a question from Edward. I mean, um, for Edward, but before I go to that, let me ask a question that came in earlier when we were talking about the stress bucket and what makes it up. And you made mention of genetics. So the question is, what can be done about the genetics that make up or that makes one prone to stress attacks? Is there anything that can be done for them? Yeah. I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, at the moment anyway, within at least from, from sort of um, medical sciences, I think your, your genetics is, is, is what it is at the moment. Uh, and you can't really do much about it. But from a mental health perspective though, it's, understanding your vulnerabilities 
it's a helpful way because then it means that you understand what are potential difficulties or pitfalls for you and you can try and avoid them. So let's, let me give you a good example using a physical health. If you know you're diabetic, you're not going to go around stopping your face with sugar and everything because you know that's not going to help your diabetes. So if you know that, let's say, for example, you have a genetic preponderance towards anxieties uh, and that there is a history of anxiety in your, in, maybe like in your family, then you want to try and manage how you expose yourself to anxious situations. And if you find yourself going into an anxious situation, you want to actively manage that and make sure that you're doing something about it. You know, so, so you'll find that for some people, something might be an issue and a difficulty and some people it's not. So I think one of the things to, to recognize from the biology is it helps you at least to be aware of where the potential difficulties are. You know, so, you know, so sometimes I would say to some of my patients, you know, if, if you know that you, you, you've got a family history of, you know, depressive illness and all of that, you don't want to get into an abusive relationship or you don't want to go out with somebody that's going to be condescending and put you down. Or, you know, some people might say, oh, it's water over the dog's back. But for you, you know, it might not. Or for example, let's say you've had a uh, history of abuse, for example, in the past. If you go into a working environment and you find that working environment quite harsh and, and very abusive, and you're trying to make a choice about one job or the other, you might not want to take that job because you know that that job for you is there is a higher possibility that it might trigger something because of the difficulties you've had before. So I think it's important to recognize where your genetics is and some of your vulnerabilities. And then when you're beginning to make your choices and what you do, to, it, can, it can be helpful for you to guide you and to make sure that you're sort of protecting that and you're keeping yourself from anything that may possible trigger. And of course, because you have the genetics that not necessarily mean it will translate into a, uh, an expression of illness, but it just means that you have a higher vulnerability or a higher chance of that happening. And so therefore, if you're mindful of that, then you pay a bit more attention to that area of your mental health compared to somebody else who knows they don't have that vulnerability. Thanks, Dr. Tao. Um, I'm going to give Edward the chance to ask the question himself, but um, whilst you're answering his, um, can you please add this one to it, which was sent anonymously? The question is that are all mental, re mental illnesses related to, I mean, are all mental illnesses spiritual? So, yeah. yeah, so that's the question. So Edward, you can go ahead with your question now. You're muted, Edward. Okay. I have a practical one on myself. I realized that uh, uh, sleeplessness is uh, one of the uh, negative coping mechanisms you uh, listed there. Uh, but I have developed that long time ago as a youth. I, I sleep very less. I don't know if that has become part of me. Will it, I, actually, I don't have any negative effects of, of, of that. And here I am, my family is back in Ghana. Sometimes I stay up 2 a.m., 2.33 a.m. Well, meanwhile, I have to wake up at 5 and go to work in the morning. But it doesn't affect me. I feel I'm sound, I'm okay. Would there be something hiding that probably I may not know about? But I feel okay, I feel good. It's something I've done from long back where we pray back into the, into the days. You know, so it's a habit I've developed over the years. Okay. And, and then the, my... Other question on the this one is, uh, what probably is the mental status of uh, Elijah when he declared that God should, who, you know, kill him, yes. and, and also compared to that of uh, David when he also came to Ziglag, similar situation, but he decided to uh, he acted differently actually. So, what would be the mental uh, state of these two people? Uh, in, in, that, in such scenarios. Okay. I think, uh, I think the, the, the example of, you know, your, your, your sleeping pattern uh, 
it's, it's a good example of the balance between what is normal for you as an individual and what is healthy for you. Because sometimes you can engage in a particular habit which has become normal for you, but from a pure health status may not necessarily be optimally healthy for you. And because it has not given you any significant problem now, does not mean that potentially it could not give you significant problems. And of course, the other question would be, well, you might not see it as a problem in the fact that, you, well, I sleep and I get up, but is there a problem somewhere else? Are you, are you finding, you know, you get tired with other things? What about other indices of your physical health? Because we know that rest is important because that's what gives the body time to shut down and all the systems to kind of recalibrate itself. So you need a measure of rest. But there are certain things based on habit and the way we've lived a personal lifestyle that some of us have adapted and just by your own, it works well and doesn't have any negative effect. And sometimes that can happen. And sometimes people, you see some people who sleep little and they, they feel okay. Some people need so much hours of sleep and they feel okay. From a scientific view, there's an average number of hours that you sleep to have an optimum health. But you always, you know, as with most, things in science, you have people on outliers on one extreme or the other. So some people, you know, if they don't get six, seven hours sleep, they're just so grumpy and they just can't survive. Some people survive on four hours sleep and that's been their pattern and that's fine. So so I guess in some ways it's, it's the impact that has on you and whether it's causing you any negative that will help you to realize that no, actually this is a problem for me or not. So so that's that's the other reason. And your second question, sorry now, it's got, I was trying to keep it I think I've lost, I've lost your second, the second part of your question. The state of Elijah. Yeah, okay, yes, thank you, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, actually, when you look at the state, when you look at Elijah and you look at David, they are, they are an example of almost, when you look at, I think Elijah had gone through a situation, reading on it and, and kind of trying to understand, it was almost like, you know, the, the, the situation with uh, Ahab's wife, was almost like a deluge in his bucket that his coping mechanism and the holes he had in his bucket just couldn't cope with that. And he just kind of overran in that moment. So he got so overwhelmed by, by the acuteness of that situation and the overwhelming of that situation that he despaired. And in that moment, he kind of you know, lost the, the perception and he seems to have fallen into almost like a depressive state to think, look, God, I don't really think I really want to continue with this. I think I'd just be better if you can take me. Whereas with David, he found himself in a situation where, yeah, there was a, an acute situation that kind of overfilled his bucket. But I think maybe based on David's relationship with God and, and, the, and, the, and the holes that he already had in his bucket, it did not actually completely overfill. It was heartbroken. It was sad. But that's natural because if and that has happened to any of us, for him to uh, act any differently would have meant it wasn't normal. So, he, he, you know, feeling sad, feeling all of that was there. But the fact that he was able to encourage himself and then find a way around it, it's almost to me a reflection that he had sufficient holes in his bucket. That even though you could see some of his men were so devastated that they were going to stone him because for them, their bucket just overflowed. They couldn't deal with that. That was too much for them. Whereas I think David had sufficient holes in his bucket that even such a traumatic incident did not send him the bend. And that's what I mean about, that's the, the reality and the challenge we, that sometimes things will happen to us. And, and, and for some people, so you could see, David and his men were exactly in the same situation. David lost family, they lost family. Some of them lost it completely and they just wanted to die and kill David. Whereas David felt, okay, even though this is terrible, I'll seek the Lord and then the Lord's strength and encourage him and then he will be able to move on. And that's what I mean about some of the resilience and some of the strategies we build in ourselves can, can make a difference how we go. But even for those who go, if they realize that they are going, just as David did, when his men were going, suddenly David helped them to put more holes in their bucket because he redirected their gaze back to God and encouraged them in God and as they focused in God, it was almost the equivalent of suddenly they found more holes in their bucket and then suddenly they were able to contain it because then they decided they were not going to stone David, but they were rather joining, pursue, and then overcame. So, so the fact that your bucket overspills is not fatalistic and it doesn't mean that's the end of it. You can always, you can do something about it. 
And that's where, you know, working with each other, and that's what I mean about sharing our experiences. So for them, that was an overwhelming, and if those people had been on their own, they will have lost faith, and some of them might have thinking that was the end of it. But because they were with somebody else who had a different perspective, who was able to help them to see differently, share it, and that's the whole, again, that fits into the importance of not isolating yourself or, or taking those situations by yourself. So sharing and bringing that perspective. Because to them, this was like, a, we're going to die. There is nothing. And David was able to say, no, 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 no. God can still do something out of this. And for me, that is a very good example, actually, of why we need one another. And why, if you isolate yourself and you ostracize yourself, sometimes situations can look overwhelming and destructive. Whereas somebody else could come alongside you, give you a different perspective, and then suddenly there is almost that hope. And, and the most important thing in life is about hope. As long as we have hope, then we kind of move along. And no matter how difficult and challenging it is, when, when, when hope is extinguished in our hearts, that is a very, very challenging state. And some of the significant mental health difficulties bring us into that. And that goes again to your question about Elijah. When hope is extinguished, then actually death looks like, and, then, and that's why you see the issue of suicide. When people get into such a depressed state that actually they lose connection with reality and their perspective of what's going on is completely collapsed, then actually death looks like almost a better way out than having to deal with that situation. And that can happen too. So the fact that you're a Christian does not mean you're immune from that. So that's, that state of hopelessness can lay hold of anybody. So it's important to understand that. And that's why it's important to understand why we need to come alongside each other. Because for some people, it momentarily, they might lose that sense of hope and they think everything is gone. And God had to help Elijah in that situation. Because Elijah left to himself, who could probably have done something to himself. So then God had to speak hope and present a different perspective for him in order to move him out of that state. And we can do that for one another. We can be bearers of hope. We can be like those four friends who, who, who was paralytic and they couldn't get to Jesus. And we could be those four people who take the roof tiles off, take all the ceilings and lower the guy down in front of Jesus. Get him to Jesus. Get him back to that place of hope. Get him back to that place where he just holds on for another minute or two and then he makes that transition to recovery and then things begin to get better. So that's so powerful. And that's the ministry we have to one another. But let's know that Christianity does not preclude us from coming to such a place of desperate place and depression. It can happen to anybody. And because you're a Christian, does not mean you are immune from that. We know, sadly, pastors who have taken their own lives. And we can't say, oh, no, they're not Christians. No, they were people who we knew by their lives had lived and demonstrated, but they found themselves in a very dark place. And some of, you know, this is rare, but it is not impossible. And this is part of the challenge that we face and where we hope that we will not, none of us will find ourselves there. But my hope is if for any reason, any of us find ourselves there, that brethren around us will be able to be bearers of hope and light and be able to carry us in that moment when we cannot carry ourselves until we come out of that dark place and come to a place where we can begin to then seek recovery and seek to be reestablished back to God. And then the final question is about spirituality there. One of my big bugbearers is this whole issue around mental health is, the way I will answer that question is this. My understanding from scripture is that every sickness is as a result of the fall of man. When God created us, there was no sickness. When man fell, sickness came. So we know the origin of sickness. The origin of sickness was the consequence of the fall. Now, I throw a question back to believers. I says, when people have physical illness, I don't hear people say that is spiritual. Because in my understanding, when I hear that is spiritual, it's having a connotation. It's saying that it is spiritual because there's a demonic influence. Like there's nothing else practically that you can do about it. Whereas I always ask the people the questions, when somebody has physical health condition, we don't say, oh, you have physical health condition. It means you are not strong. It means it's a demon. We cast out the demon. You shouldn't do anything about it. We still encourage them, get the physical health, get the practical health, do everything you can. And we're still praying. 
So we recognize that there's a spiritual dimension. So for me, every illness has a spiritual dimension. Yes, is it possible that some specific instances, it may be directly linked to demonic activity? Yes, it's not impossible. But does it mean every mental illness is a direct link to demonic activity? I don't think that's what scripture teaches. And I don't think that's the reality of what life expresses. I know some people will use that scripture in uh, where Jesus cast out the demonic man. But I ask you a question. When Jesus cast out the demon in that demonic man, what happened to that man? Scripture says he came back to his senses. He was completely and fully whole. Just as we saw when Jesus physically healed people, they were completely whole. So I sometimes say to people, if it's all demonic, you've already had a demonic ministration, you've casted out the demons, why come the man is still continuing to have those mental health situation? If it was just purely demonic, once you cast out the demon, the guy should be whole and he should be back to himself. It just makes you realize that actually some of it is nothing to do with demonic. Some of it has got a lot of other things going on as well. But does that mean that every time we have an illness, there's a spiritual dimension? Of course there is, because every illness is come from, from the enemy. So just as in physical health, we pray, we stand alongside them, we challenge them. But to me, I think there is a, there is a sense that with mental illness, we've just sort of put it on one side. And then there's this, almost like a sense of shame and second class and you're not spiritual enough, if you were spiritual enough, or, or in fact, some people will say, no, you shouldn't be sick enough. I've heard people say, oh, but you can't cure it. So are you then kind of perpetuating dependence culture? But I, I think I addressed this when we did the depression and anxiety. All the physical health medication you take, it doesn't cure nothing. It just manages it. So why should managing mental illness then be any different from physical illness? It's the same, it's the same concept. If you're diabetic, if you stop taking your insulin, you will die. The, the, the insulin doesn't cure your diabetes. It just helps you to, you know, your system to deal with the sugar so that you don't have the negative consequence. If you're high blood, if you have hypertension and you're on medication, as long as you take your medication, you're fine. The day you stop taking your medication, you might try an ambulance. So yeah, so the medication is not like curing you as such. It is managing that condition in order to enable you to live a quality life. So if for some reason on your mental health, you need to take a tablet or you need to get some intervention, if it, that enables you to live a good quality of life and be all that God has called you to do, in my books, I think that's fair. And I don't think as believers, we should shame or put some discrimination between that. Yeah, we continue to pray. We continue to trust God for wholeness. We continue to ask God to take away sickness. Bible says, I will bless your waters. I will bless your bread. I will take sickness away from the midst of you. We understand that as the promises of God. We press on onto that. But on this side of eternity, we know that will not be perfect. Until we see him, then we can come into the fullness of that. But on this side of eternity, we have to grasp with it. And therefore, we need to understand that mental health is just in the same plane as physical health. And we just have to deal with it, live with it, and get on with it. Sorry, I think I've got a bit, it's, it's just one of my pet talks. I think I got slightly yeah. carried away there. So, yeah, yeah I'll just stop we, there now. Yeah, we've got, we got it. We could feel the, the passion that, I mean, that's coming from the event. We, thank you so much, Dr. Tao. I think we've really overshot our time on this, and therefore I'll need to close the curtains on this. But um, before I do that, let me quickly put out um, let me thank you specifically, Dr. Taro, for your time and making space for us to engage. And let me thank our men as well who have um, just been behind this. I know, I know. I mean, it's most times very difficult for us as men to jump behind this, but there's been such, such a support and such a rally around this that I've not seen before. So thank you all men who were present. Um, I just want to just to continue from one thing that you have mentioned there, Dr. Tao, about we supporting each other. So there's a conversation we are going to continue. And should you in any way need someone to talk to, please don't hesitate. Um, we have a City Hill, we, within City Hill Church, we have elders, we have a City Hill wellness team who are ready to support you, to walk with you and to talk to you. And they will be ready to guide you to the appropriate um, people who can really help you if it is aggravated or if it is, I mean, beyond management. Um, the other one is that, I mean, other thing I want to say is that we do have another session with Dr. Tao coming up next month, 
um, next month. Is it which day? I'll find the date, but we have another session. I think it's the second. I think it's the second Friday. Five. The second Friday. I think it should be yeah. the second Friday. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, Dr. Tawo, what would we be talking? I mean, with you when we meet on that? Is it going to be another main session or woman session? <laughs> no, no, no. We're we're, we're back. We're, we're we're back together now. I think we'll kind of be okay. looking at sort of parenting and children. But, but one of the things I realized in, in the last two, which are quite important, we haven't looked at it, and I'm probably going to try and factor that into parents, role of parent, but also the whole issue around abuse and abusive behaviors okay. uh, and, 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 and that whole challenge. So we might try and find a way, but, it, but it's more like looking at just sort of just general talk about, you know, what are helpful things about parents, parents and children, what are helpful ways to think about children and what are children meant to help? Because I remember somebody asking me, I, I had a conversation just last week here and I was saying to somebody about, I'm a child psychiatrist and I was telling him what I did. I was like, I never really thought about that, that children can have the same difficulties. And I'm like, well, yeah, they do actually. It might present differently, but these things can happen. So, so maybe just a bit about, you know, what should we look out for when we're thinking about our children's mental health and what are specific areas in terms of helping us to better parent our children. And I think we might maybe find some ways to talk because I'm just mindful there's a huge beat that we left out in the first two about the areas of maybe abuse, maybe speak a little bit about that, yeah. All right, Dr. Chawo, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and it's been a great time with you. Um, before everyone leaves, um, let me just remind you that we have um, a poll um, for you just to highlight three of areas that you want to hear more of. Um, just in one minute, if you can just select three areas that you think you want to hear more of, um, that would be great. And I'll take the opportunity to thank you so much again, Dr. Taiwo, and for our men as well. Um, there are some more questions actually coming through, Dr. Tao. So I'll put them together yeah. and then I'll send to you. And I think we'll create, we'll probably answer, I'll put the answers somewhere on one of our Facebook pages or somewhere else to okay. allow people to revisit. Yeah. So, um, I, shall I say on behalf of myself, or on behalf of everyone here, thank you, Dr. Tao. <laughs> on behalf of myself, thank you to everyone. <laughs> Um, please make sure you answer the poll before you leave. 